You, you all have comics there, so I actually don't have to talk, which would be great. Um, you'll have to bear with me. I, I still get nervous occasionally in talks, especially when I'm speaking to um, computery people, because I'm, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a computery people at all, uh, c computer person at all, um, which is uh, what makes it strange to be talking on technical subjects at Google a uh, fair few of times. So um, uh, this is me normally. Um, I'm a Animator, cartoonist. Uh, my day job is uh, is this sort of thing, um, visual effects, uh, which I do do on computers, but very reluctantly. Um, I started on Iron Giant, hand drawn on paper, um, like a medieval peasant. Um, nowadays, of course, uh, we do everything on uh, on these big machines, um, which I actually used to resent uh, quite a bit. Um, which is uh, strange, why it's a bit strange that I wound up doing this comic about these two crazy kids. Um, if you don't know who they are, you might have kind of briefly uh, passed by them in Computers 101. Uh, Charles Babbage, Ada Lovelace. Um, I first met them in 2009 uh, when a friend of mine, Sue Sharman, started Ada Lovelace Day, which you might have heard of, um, sort of online festival of women in computing. And uh, we were in a pub and she said, uh, Sid, you should, you're a woman in tech. Uh, you should do a comic. Uh, like, a, you should do a post for uh, Ada Lovelace Day. Um, so I said, I, I don't even know who Ada Lovelace is, and I'm also not really in tech. Um, so I, I just quickly Wikipedia'd her like anybody would do. And uh, um, it was just such an extraordinary story. Uh, and to me, it struck me as very comic booky. Um, so I just sat down in an evening and sort of dashed off the following uh, comic, which um, this is cleaned up from its initial appearance. Um, and this was just uh, to introduce uh, Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage to people who might not know who they are. Um, so um, Lord Byron, famous poet, uh, and that case, uh, was married to Anna Varela Milbank, an amateur mathematician. Um, they split when Ada was about a year old. Um, Ada never met her father. He fled the country in a cloud of scandal, never came back. Um, and Ada's mother was very concerned that she would inherit her father's wild blood, what people call this poetical uh, tendency. Um, so uh, Ada's mother's uh, kind of solution to this was to uh, train her in mathematics, logic, and science. Um, so she had a very unusual education for a girl. Um, Charles Babbage. Uh, an occasion professor of mathematics, a uh, position held by Newton, currently held by Stephen Hawking, so you can tell he's a pretty clever guy. Um, in his own age, he was extremely famous for um, these mysterious calculating machines that he was burning through government money uh, designing. Um, uh, the most famous is the Difference Engine, mostly because the name is really cool, and it also has a book, uh, The Difference Engine, written about what if he had built it. Um, they met in uh, 1833, um, and um, Ada immediately fell uh, madly in love with this machine. Um, the, uh, the, the fragment of the difference engine you can still see in the uh, Science Museum. It's a wonderful object, it's about this big, made of brass. Um, that's the only part that was ever built of uh, any of these machines. Um, but uh, the one that she, the, what, what she was really intrigued with was um, the uh, oh, sorry, this, uh, this gag. Uh, <laughs> uh, this gag, I think, might have spelled my doom. Um, so um, after she uh, met Babbage, she immediately asked him for the blueprints for this device. She was very, very keen on machinery. She'd always been um, kind of a fan of taking apart uh, little machines and clocks, um, doing factory tours, that sort of thing. Um, so she was very, very keen on this uh, device. But um, the one she was really into was the analytical engine, which was Babbage's next piece of vaporware, uh, which was um, a machine like the difference engine. So the difference engine was a machine for addition uh, uh, to, do, to print logarithmic tables. Um, it was basically a gigantic adder that could print um, 
uh, in order to, to print these books of tables that would be used by actuaries or navigators or whoever, um, pretty much the same year he met Ada in the early 1830s, Babbage came up with an idea for a much more complex machine. Um, the analytical engine would be, um, would first of all have a memory, so it could store the results, and then it could feed the results back into the machine and use them. Uh, and the whole thing was programmed with punch cards. Um, and a little later in the talk, I'll show you uh, kind of how it worked. Um, in pretty much every possible way, except for being made of brass and driven by steam, it was a computer. Um, Babbage worked on very, very elaborate designs, thousands of pages of notebooks on this machine. Um, unfortunately, because he had already failed to build a considerably less complicated machine, he wasn't able to secure any more funding for his uh, analytical engine. Um, but he worked on it for many years. Um, for Ada, it was this machine that she was very deeply fascinated with. Um, she knew Babbage for about a decade uh, before writing this paper that she's so famous for. Um, and um, she, being a woman, of course, her position had to be uh, kind of on the side, looking in. Um, but her kind of big chance came in uh, 42 when um, there was a publication uh, in a French paper from an Italian who had transcribed a speech of Babbage's in Turin, uh, in Italy. Um, this was the only really public presentation Babbage had ever done on the analytical engine. He was not secretive about it, but he wasn't really pushing it that much. Um, so Ada took this uh, paper and translated it uh, into English because translation was a acceptable position for a woman in science at that time. Um, however, because she was so um, uh, into this machine, and because she had many ideas of her own uh, about it, she um, began adding footnotes. Uh, and when the paper came out in 43, I should say this is from the original uh, comic, so this is actually the wrong date. Uh, in 43, the paper, the, her uh, notes were published, and the footnotes were about three times as long as the original paper <laughs> that she was transcribing. Um, and in, that foot, in those footnotes, there's all sorts of really interesting things. Um, the first description of a loop, for example, um, some wonderful uh, programs, I guess you would call them in a way, um, and her thoughts on the engine, which we'll get into later. Um, this is the program, Bernoulli numbers. It's more of what you'd now call a state table. It's just describing the setup of the machine in each uh, particular kind of iteration of what it's doing. Um, unfortunately, of course, Ada Lovelace died uh, very young, 1830, uh, in 36. Uh, years old, um, and Babbage never did finish any of his machines. Um, so um, this is me, you know, kind of coming to the end of this story in Wikipedia and thinking, well, I can't end the comic like that. That's, you know, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> you know, that's a really dumb ending. So uh, I added the following panel. Um, I think I was vaguely aware of steampunk as a thing. I hadn't read The Difference Engine, this famous book where they actually build a machine, but uh, I, I'd heard of it. So uh, I just added this to give a nice punchline uh, to the comic. I think I was thinking of the Avengers. <laughs> if you see them, actually. <laughs> ah? <laughs> um, I also added the following, because um, something to bear in mind is I, I do hate computers very much. So um, there were two big misconceptions about this panel. Um, the first misconception is that um, it turned up in uh, also all over the internet a couple of days after I put up this little comic strip, all of which you have seen at this stage. Um, it turned up, I think, in Wired and a couple of other places saying, this person is going to do a comic about Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage fighting crime. <laughs> um, which, I had no intention of doing this was a joke. <laughs> um, the other misconception is that they're superheroes. They are not. They are clearly supervillains. <laughs> because they invented this horrible thing, the computer. Um, you know, which was the misery of my life uh, pretty much every day. Um, so the gag here is Ada, of course, was raised to destroy all poetry and... Um, Charles Babbage, uh, famous as he was for inventing these uh, calculating machines, was much more famous at the end of his life for his crusade against street music. 
um, which uh, made him infamous in late Victorian England. We'll find more about that. Um, anyway, I'm very suggestible, and I was putting off working on something else. So uh, I started this comic, uh, Treaty Goggles. Uh, and it was very, very, very uh, informal. Um, it was really just um, a way of blowing off steam at the end of the day and to draw as well, because uh, in animation, of course, we don't draw. We manipulate objects in 3D space. Um, so I missed drawing, and I was like, ah, if I draw a little comic. Uh, in this comic, they fight crime. Uh, they fight crime badly, because otherwise it wouldn't be funny. Um, uh, I think the, the thing that uh, kind of uh, eventually, through a strange series of events, resulted me in being here uh, is Google Books. Uh, and I'm really not just saying this because I originally designed this talk for Google Books uh, in California. Um, Google Books is, is what transformed this from a kind of little squib of a comic into something that I think was genuinely interesting. Um, the comic began uh, when Google Books was at very early stages, um, and it was dumping the 19th century uh, searchable online in a way that had never happened before. Um, and that meant any random clown, such as me, uh, could just type Babbage, Lovelace into these search terms and turn up uh, just sheer amounts of stuff. Um, this is very typical. Um, I think the first thing that I was really surprised to find was that Babbage and Lovelace were very, very famous people in their period. Um, Lovelace was a celebrity child. Um, and uh, Babbage was actually a big-time celebrity himself as this sort of intellectual who had invented this amazing thing that nobody could understand. Um, so this is from the Deseret News in Utah. Um, just a piece of anecdotes about them, which is very commonly the way this shows up. Um, I like this one, Babbage the Logarithmetical Frankenstein. <laughs> um, Lovelace talk shows up considerably less than Babbage. Um, uh, yeah, um, Lady Lovelace, uh, he was amused by my saying that Babbage and not Byron should have been her father. She, she was apparently a bit of a bore. That's one of the things you can get out of people's anecdotes about her is that she was a bit of a drag talking about mathematics uh, at dinner parties, which I advise you not to do. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you get a ton of stuff on Babbage all the time, not so much about Lovelace, because she's much more, um, uh, being female, of course, she's a less public uh, figure. But um, it was enough to kind of um, start adding these little bits to the blog. So this is the way that the blog developed. Um, this would be the end of the comic. Uh, here's Ada Lovelace being chased by monkeys, as, uh, of course, you, have, you are. And... Um, uh, then they'd be followed by all these footnotes, which would be whatever stuff I had found uh, online, um, just sort of browsing around. Um, training methods of organ grinders monkeys, uh, the Bridgewater Treatise, which was this thing that Babbage wrote. So um, through that kind of combination of improvising online and reading, uh, I guess, eyewitness accounts of them in the period, I was constructing these characters. Uh, and they're very consciously comic book characters. They're not intended as a kind of reproduction of them as historical people, but they're, they're I guess, a riff or an improvisation on them. Um, Lovelace and here's Babbage. Um, Babbage is always very easy to draw because he, he wrote uh, tons of stuff, actually, even though, uh, weirdly, the only thing he didn't write about was the analytical engine. He wrote about taxation, and he wrote about copyright, and he wrote this massive autobiography that's super entertaining. Very, very funny, entertaining guy. Um, so his personality is super clear. I was really pleased to find this in Punch. Uh, so this is him in 1852. He's really angry that his, um, they didn't put his, uh, the engine bit, the difference engine bit in the great exhibition. Uh, so he's, uh, he was only honorably mentioned, so he's pretty mad. Um, but I think, you know, he comes out. <laughs> um, this is, uh, so um, just to kind of, I, I said I'd talk about my process of creative transformation, so I guess that's what I'll do. So this is um, the uh, New York Mirror, 1833. This is the same year she met Babbage. Um, I don't, if you can't read it, it says, um, Oh, fie, it is said that Ada Byron, sole daughter of the noble bard, is the most coarse and vulgar woman in England. Um, which is one of those things that, you know, it's very intriguing. And it's true in her letters she does swear, uh, which is very unusual for a Victorian woman. 
Um, this is something else I found. This is from, uh, this is actually from Babbage's pamphlet on the Great Exhibition, which is mostly about why isn't my engine in the Great Exhibition, um, where he's describing what it can do. And one of the things that he describes is the world's first error pop-up. Um, if you put the wrong logarithm in, it will put a plate that would snap up and say wrong. <laughs> um, in his autobiography, he adds the continually ringing loud bell, uh, which would be fantastic, I'm sure, if you were the guy in charge of the machine. Um, so with this, I came up with uh, Ada Lovelace's debugging uh, one of her programs here in the engine. Um, Babbage is showing the engine to uh, Queen Victoria, of course. Uh. Um, so the comic, I, you know, uh, generally speaking, if you read the book, it's, it's mostly me making fun of computers um, and just using these hapless people as my uh, tools for this. Um, uh, but I was able to find as well um, some really magical stuff in Google Books, and uh, I guess you know, important, unimportant, but but really important stuff as well. Um, this is a letter that would certainly have been lost um, to scholarship if it hadn't been for Google Books, um, because it only appears, as far as I know, in a very obscure uh, journal called the Southern Review, um, Maryland, 1864. Um, and they're just printing letters home from people and just random stuff. And there's a guy who met Babbage in there. Um, and we have here, um, Babbage uh, spoke highly of her mathematical powers and her peculiar capability, higher he said than that of anyone he knew, to prepare, I believe it was, the descriptions connected with this calculating machine. Um, he says, I fear I'm not expressing myself rightly here as to the precise nature of the subject. I think he's, the descriptions is the state tables, the programs. Um, which is, a, you know, it's pretty magical to find something like that. Um, there's a, it's quite long. He goes, he really goes into um, kind of the relationship. This is a couple of years after Ada had died. Um, so that kind of uh, thing, you know, this, uh, I, I guess, intersection between scholarship and primary sources, and then just improvisation and imagination. That, that's what the comic was basically about. Um, so um, these two characters, I think, uh, you know, became pretty clear to me. But um, when I had to sit down to write a book, I didn't have to sit down to write a book. They, they, they told me to write a book, so I wrote a book. <laughs> um, there was a third character that uh, I had to come to grips with, um, and that was the analytical engine. Um, the analytical engine in the comic appears like this. Um, this is George Eliot uh, getting her novel spell checked uh, in the machine. She gets lost and almost eaten. But uh, um, in the comic, the machine, like the way it's actually described by contemporary people and even by Babbage and even by Lovelace, you just get this impression of this enormous bunch of cogs doing something. Um, and it's very complicated and you can't understand it. Um, but um, uh, because I had so much primary stuff about uh, Babbage and Lovelace, I felt I had to have, now here's the real analytical engine. Um, so I sat down to do a visualization. Um, and I was very upset to find that no one had done one that I could rip off. Um, <laughs> all I had was the Babbage uh, plans. So this is um, plan 25. Um, this is a pretty famous image. You might have seen it in computer history books. Um, but um, actually, it's a lot more ambiguous than it might seem. Um, you know, these are the cards, the famous punch cards, but how are they attached and where do they go? Are they up? Or are they down? Are they to scale? Um, uh, Babbage left not a lot of elevations, which makes it hard to kind of understand the machine. Um, so I had to sit down with these plans. And I have to say, I also used um, the scholarly work of Alan Bromley, the late Alan Bromley, who um, really went through and explained the mathematics of the machine um, with extreme detail. So between the Bromley papers and the diagrams, I was able to do some elevations. Come on, there we go. Um, that's to scale. <laughs> it's a really big machine. Um, to get a sense of kind of the reality of this thing. Um, and using that, I was able to produce this, which was the first um, visualization, to my knowledge, of the machine. 
Um, it should be fairly accurate-ish. <laughs> um, I, I have a feeling it couldn't have been freestanding like this um, just because of the sheer weight of the thing. I, have a, I think it would probably have to be in those warehouse buildings basically embedded into uh, the structure of a, of a, a pretty heavy, hefty building. Um, but um, I'll go over how this machine works because uh, that's kind of my uh, purpose for being here, I suppose. Um, so this is the uh, store, um, which is the memory, basically. Um, it's a lot easier to describe this machine um, in uh, Maya, actually. So um, I'm going to switch over. Um, Babbage himself said that one of the reasons he didn't describe his machine very much was because it's very difficult to explain um, how it works without being able to show it. Um, and boy, is he ever right, because um, I find it impossible to explain without, uh, without, and I find it actually impossible to understand uh, without basically building it and animating it. Um, but that wound up being a really, really good tool. Um, so this is just a slice of it. Uh, to see how the whole thing looks. Turn on the whole, here's my naming convention whole thing. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, come on. Uh, as you can, you can see why I'm only using a slice. It's, it's uh, my laptop is pretty strong, but it's really struggling with the, um, come on, there we go. <laughs> there we go, okay, there we go. So, um, what you're looking at here is a machine for manipulating very large numbers. Um, that's what Babbage uh, uh, designed it for, and every single piece of the machine is to add, subtract, multiply, divide large numbers as quickly as possible. Um, the machine was not designed to produce a single result. It was designed to run through iterations of a formula to print out into books. Um, so basically, what you would have is, you know, we need X formula for um, life insurance. You know, what are the um, premiums if you're such and such an age? And it would just run down um, and print for each successive age uh, what the statistics are. Um, that's the sort of thing this machine was for. Um, each of these columns is a number. Um, Babbage specified 50 digits for his ideal machine. So these are 50 gears. And the way you store a number is you just turn each gear. So if you want to put 351, you go 3, 5, 1 places on each gear. And you just go down. Um, even I can understand that part, so it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, as to how much storage he had, uh, everyone wants more memory. I think Babbage said, you know, ideally a thousand places. Uh, you can see if I pop back to the design, he puts the memory sort of running off the page. <laughs> so I'm sure he would have ideally added uh, more and more memory to that. Um, and the memory just goes off into the distance. Uh, so if I turn that off. So each layer, all that height is only because it's such big numbers that it's for. Um, so the mass of the machinery is, is just replicating up the decimal places. Um, so I'm just, uh, this is just a very super, super, super simplified demo with one, high quality here, um, with one decimal place, just to kind of go through um, this amazing machine. Uh, because it, it's an absolute thing of beauty. And when you consider this was designed in the 1830s and 40s by a guy with, you know, literally a feather and some, <laughs> and candles. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing because this was all held in his head. Um, it took three types of card to run the machine. Uh, number card, variable card, this is the addressing system basically. Uh, and the operations card which has the program itself. Um, fortunately, very recently, um, I had some lovely pictures sent to me by Bruce Sterling, actually, um, uh, who's in Turin and found um, some of the stuff that Babbage left when he gave his talk there. Um, this is the number card sample that he left. So this is pi written on the number card. And you can see the way the card is written is that the important uh, places, so three has three unpunched 
holes. Um, here's an operations card. Come back to that in a sec. But if you look at the, let's go, if we go back to the number card, um, the whole machine was built off of the um, principle of the Jacquard loom. Um, if you ever see one of those, all it, that happens with the loom is that you have, go to the uh, number cards over here. So you'd have an array, and you know, on a number card you'd have like 10, le 10 little levers for 50 decimal places, so it's like 500 little levers. This is actually not um, uh, 500, I, I didn't go that uh, crazy with it, but um, it would have been an extremely complicated machine. Um, and the way it works is the, um, the card, the spindle pushes the card forward. If there's a hole, it just goes through the lever and nothing happens. If there's not a hole, then the uh, lever pushes um, forward and basically engages some part of the machine to the power. Um, underneath the machine are cams continually turning, um, driven presumably by the steam engine that's puffing away in a corner. Um, and the lever will just hook up something to the cam and it will go either up and down or round and round. That's basically the two things that cam can do, but if you put them together in clever ways, you can do um, some pretty good stuff. Um, so that's how the cards work. The way the machine works is, first thing that happens is the variable card, which I, I, I always call them address cards just because it's a lot clearer to me to think of this as the addressing system. And this would have a hole, I presume, for each position in the memory. So you would eventually have a ginormous card unless you came up with some more clever system. Um, and that just depresses a lever which hooks up its corresponding section in the memory to a little pinion. Then the number card, come on. Uh, sorry, red means it's driving, green means it's being driven. Uh, it's just a bit clearer to understand uh, that way. So um, the, then the number card will read just by turning, all it does is just say turn three places. Turn however many places there are no holes in this section. So um, that turns three places, so three, the rack goes three places, pinion goes three places, gear goes three places, it's now reading three. Um, disengage, so then it reads in another number. Variable card selects the address, number card reads out a number into it. Um, these cards are run completely separately. So when you're setting up the program, you're wrangling three completely separate cards and you really better hope that you've got them in the right order. Otherwise you'll get those pop-ups. Uh. Um, right, now, the operations card is uh, to me where the real uh, beauty of the machine is. Um, if you go pop over to the operations card here. There we go. Um, you can see here this is Babbage's own handwriting. Um, he has all the functions add, subtract, multiply, divide. This is demonstrating a division. Um, it's also got these two holes, add rotation, subtract rotation. That means the machine could instruct itself to go back or forward uh, depending on the state of the machine. Um, and I'll kind of explain how that works uh, in a sec. Um, so how could you go through such a complex procedure with a single hole? Um, because addition alone took several dozen steps of many, many different bits of machinery. Um, the way he did that is with the barrels, uh, which is funny because he actually took these from the barrel organs uh, that he hated so much. Um, but he must have loved that mechanism because he, he stuck these barrels all over the place. Uh, and the way that he uses them is that the operations card will say, you know, add, let's say. Push forward and then the barrels will rotate to a wedge of instructions. So all that uh, the add uh, position does is say, go to the add uh, set of instructions. Um, and once that's set up, the numbers are then ordered from the variable card. Uh, variable card hooks up. It's got its own barrel. Any, any of the cards are using barrels because they, they need to run through a bunch of stuff. Sorry. Um, 
And that reads off the designated address into the ingress axis, uh, which then reads it off into these wonderful wheels. I love these things. Uh, he got rid of these in the later um, designs for the machine, which is sad, because I, I, I love the clarity of this sort of giant data transfer thing in the middle. Um, so this will send uh, the number to this section. Each of these sections in the mill, um, if pop back to look at the, uh, so each of these sections is specialized gearing. Um, and it's, it's largely adding um, stuff, but just special types of addition. Um, and it just says, okay, go to the adding section. So it feeds the one number in, picks up another number, feeds that one in. Uh, and then the barrels just go through their little routine. Um, this obviously is a cartoon. They're, they're, these are really, really complicated bits of, uh, bits of gear. Um, but I just put this together for my own kind of elucidation. Um, so they run through their instruction set. There's the result. The variable cards select the address that they want the result to read out to. So it's fed into the egress axis, or output, I guess we call it now. Variable cards pick up, uh, you know, give the uh, where they want that to read to, and that reads off, and done. Um, Ada had a very, uh, although she's known kind of generally as the first programmer, that's not actually, first of all, true, or second of all, that critical. Obviously, Babbage wrote programs for the machine when he was designing it. Um, they're much simpler than the Bernoulli one, uh, which he and Ada collaborated on, which is in the uh, paper. Um, but uh, Babbage also had assistants that might have written some simple programs for it. Um, so she wasn't the first, and she wasn't kind of there at his elbow writing programs for him. Um, in any case, she herself complained a lot about those state tables um, when she wrote the paper. She was like, this is a huge pain, and it's really annoying and fiddly, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm a countess, damn it. Um, what uh, Ada's actual main interest in the machine was in uh, connecting it with the ideas of this guy, uh, who was her uh, mathematics tutor, who's Augustus de Morgan. Um, if you've heard of de Morgan's laws, this is that de Morgan. Um, de Morgan basically took uh, Ada through his University College London course, um, which he had just started. Obviously, as a woman, she couldn't go, but he took her through it by correspondence. Um, he was a family friend. Um, not someone they paid or anything like that. They hung out, I guess you could say. Um, and at the same time that um, Lovelace was hanging out with Babbage, she was also hanging out with uh, de Morgan at the time that de Morgan was developing a mathematical system of logic. This is 10 years before Boole. Um, you can see what de, de Morgan's logic looks like here. He's trying to find a way to turn it into mathematical formulas. Um, and for Lovelace, she looked at this one. Click. Uh, I think for Lovelace, being kind of in proximity with these two ideas in ferment of Babbage's machine for manipulating numbers and de Morgan's concept of logic as mathematics, which was very, very, very new. I mean, de Morgan was really pretty much one of the first people who was doing this sort of thing. Um, this kind of led her, uh, pop up past that, uh, this led to the, probably her most famous passage in the paper, which is to link the two together and say this is not necessarily a arithmetic machine. This can be a logic machine. Um, she says, uh, holds a position wholly its own. Um, in enabling mechanism to combine together general symbols. She's Victorian, so it takes a long time to get through uh, a sentence. Um, in successions of unlimited variety and extent, a uniting link is established between the operations of matter and the abstract mental processes of the most abstract branch of mathematical science. A new vast and powerful language is developed for the future use of analysis. Um, she comes back to this idea again and again in the paper that, um, uh, for example, she says, if you took uh, musical composition and could find a way to develop it as a series of instructions. The machine could be taught to compose music, scientific music, she says. It could be taught to compose scientific music of unlimited uh, variety and extent. Um, so 
uh, for me, looking at this, sorry, this is uh, my uh, Ada Lovelace programming uh, engine. I, I'm always struck by how hard it must have been to keep the cars together. So I've designed for her a uh, kind of machine to do that. Um, for me, to, it was only when I built this thing um, that I understood what a spectacular leap this was. Um, there's nothing in this machine uh, that would even suggest such a thing uh, to me. To me, the, and certainly to Babbage, this is a machine for arithmetic, fast arithmetic in very large numbers. And Babbage's obsession was speed. He's, I guess, a classic hardware guy, from what I understand it, in that mo most of the work that he put into it was to make it faster. Um, but Lovelace saw the connection with logic with this little bit here. And that's the add rotation, subtract rotation instruction on those cards. Um, Babbage developed for that this little thing called the conditional arm. And that would drop down if, when the machine hit, say, a certain result, or a certain level of result, that it would then instruct the machine to stop, for example, or branch to go, a different, uh, to, go to a different set of instructions. Uh, where's the animation of that? There we go. So while the barrels are going away, you can see if there's a peg and the arm is in place, um, then it instructs the machine to do something different. Um, and this is a logic. This is an if and logic system. Um, and it's this tiny piece here, um, I think, that Ada saw the possibilities of. Um, if you stripped away all the gears, which, you know, 90% of the machine is just numbers. If you take that all away and you just look at this and you start thinking what you can do with that, um, it's uh, pretty beautiful, even to me, uh, who hates computers, just to remind you. Um, so um, that's the barrels and the engine and Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage and logic and everything. So I think that's my talk. Thank you.